Hello. Okay, we're going to get started. Um, it is my great pleasure and I really mean it to introduce Dr. Tracy Bachelor. He's, uh, I consider, a uh, personal friend in, a, in addition to my mentor as well as mentor of Shoma. He's um, very well known. If I was to go through his entire CV, probably I would take the entire hour and no leave time for him to talk. So briefly, just to mention, um, he's a full professor at Harvard Mass General. He did his medical school and college here at Emory University. Uh, his internship at Yale, um, residency at Mass General, uh, fellowship at Sloan Kettering, then went back to uh, Mass General, has been there since then, been a professor since 2010. And um, he has, I have learned from him, uh, not only the passion for neuro-oncology and managing patients with brain tumors, but certainly seen a different approach to patients with CNS lymphomas. As we're talking, it's uh, really rewarding to see how uh, patients uh, may not only achieve remission, do well, but regain their neurological functions, and many of our patients go back to their uh, normal activities. Um, Dr. Bachelor is very well known uh, in many committees, and certainly as now, and he's here to talk to us about an update of uh, CNS lymphoma. Tracy. Thank you, Alfredo. And uh, it's good to be back down at Emory. I walked across the campus yesterday with my son, who is now looking at colleges. So I was twisting his arm a little bit. I bet I didn't recognize the place. <laughs> I got lost multiple times. I was suddenly on frat row. It's really changed a lot since I was here long ago, for the better, I'm sure. All right, so as Alfredo said, I'm going to talk to you today about um, uh, primary CNS lymphoma as a an uncommon to rare tumor, but one that is, I find, really fascinating and really uh, gratifying to, uh, to manage. Um, so um, without further ado, I think this is my, this will work. Oh, and I'm supposed to turn on the microphone, sorry. Okay. All right, so let me start by uh, defining what I will talk about today and what I will not cover today. So primary CNS lymphoma is defined as an extranodal non-Hodgkin lymphoma confined to craniospinal axis. It could be brain, eyes, CSF, spinal cord. Um, it's un, it, that this is less common than secondary nervous system lymphomas, which occurs when an established systemic lymphoma disseminates into the nervous system, typically to the leptomeninges about two-thirds of the time. So we'll, really, we'll focus really on primary CNS lymphomas today. And I'll also say that I'm going to focus really on primary CNS lymphomas in the immunocompetent host. So I really won't cover the immunocompromised host, but we could talk about that at the end if you'd like to. All right, so this is uh, Dan Brad is here. This is a, a uh, characteristic H&E uh, slide, dare I call it classic, uh, example of one of the features of a primary CNS diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, and that is the angiocentric pattern of tumor growth in the nervous system. And this is, uh, this, is, this is typical in the CNS. It's not typical outside the CNS. And what you see here in this H&E is in the center of the slide, a cerebral blood vessel. And then around it, surrounding it, are all these malignant lymphocytes. And then they're infiltrating uh, the neuropil. Some other unique features in terms of the pathophysiology of this tumor. When a lymphoma occurs in the nervous system, it's almost always a, an aggressive large cell lymphoma. Rarely do you see T cell, low grade lymphomas in the nervous system. And of those large cell lymphomas, almost all of them are the activated B cell immunophenotype, which is again a, a difference uh, as opposed to systemic diffuse large B cell lymphomas. And we know that that ABC immunophenotype is associated with an inferior prognosis. And this may be one of the factors as to why primary CNS lymphomas have a worse prognosis than systemic diffuse large B cell lymphomas, more ABC subtypes. 
the pathophysiology has uh, been lagging in terms of understanding kind of the drivers and the molecular wiring of this tumor, but that's changing. I'll show you a slide, I think the next slide, where there has been an identification of a number of genetic alterations which appear to be important, and some of them may be actual drivers of this tumor. And one of the key ones is this B-cell receptor pathway through uh, this Bruton's tyrosine kinase signaling down through other pathways to get to NF-kappa B, which gets turned on. So there's a high frequency of genetic lesions or aberrations that lead to aberrant uh, signaling through the NF-kappa B pathway. And each of these nodes offers some opportunities for targeted therapies. So here's a study out of uh, Boston, but uh, Dana-Farber, Mass General, where we looked uh, at uh, genomic sequencing of a number of these uh, uh, EBV negative primary CNS lymphomas from immunocompetent hosts. So this is this column right here. And I, I, I put this in to point out that these tumors have uh, the genetic underpinning of these tumors is quite different than the systemic ABC subtype of diffuse large B cell lymphoma. If you look at things like B, P16 deregulation, you can see a much higher frequency in the primary C, uh, brain lymphomas. Look at uh, MYD88 mutations, much higher frequency in the primary CNS lymphomas versus the uh, systemic. If you look at uh, chromosome 9P gains, or PD-1 or PDL1 deregulation, much higher frequency in primary CNS lymphoma versus systemic disease uh, on the order of what you see really in Hodgkin's disease. So the genetic alterations, there's a common core of them, but the frequency is quite different versus whether the diffuse large cell lymphoma is in the brain versus in the uh, uh, periphery. And we'll come back to this. Epidemiology, this is truly a rare tumor. Uh, Central Brain Tumor Registry of the U.S., best population-based data on brain tumors. Uh, about 1,500 cases a year diagnosed uh, in the U.S. Uh, from 2009 to 2013. That number is slowly creeping up, mainly because of the aging of the population. Probably the incidence has really plateaued in this disease. But the incidence clearly increased primary CNS lymphomas from the 70s to the 80s, and that was really driven at that time by the HIV pandemic. Poor prognosis relative to other uh, lymphomas, 33% five-year survival rate, 25% survival rate at 10 years. So there's really a lot of work to do uh, in terms of improving outcomes. This is highlighted by this slide. This is from a colleague in the International Extranodal Lymphoma Study Group, where they looked at survival distributions of all of the extranodal types of lymphomas. And you can see that the the type that is the absolute worst prognosis is uh, primary CNS uh, large cell lymphoma versus all of the others. Demographics, it's a, it's a tumor of related to aging, like almost all cancers, most cancers. So uh, 65 is the median age of diagnosis, slightly more common in males, rapidly progressive. One study that the time from the first symptom to diagnosis was less than three months. And most people actually present with um, alteration of mental status, personality change, cognitive changes, uh, et cetera. The International Primary CNS Lymphoma Collaborative Group, IPCG, and I'll say that from now on, uh, was formed about 15 years ago. Um, and our group uh, has developed a number of um, consensus guidelines uh, for primary CNS lymphomas. And so one is kind of the baseline evaluation, uh, what we advise so that all patients uh, uh, have done. This was published more than 10 years ago now. We're updating this. Not a lot of updates are going to be in there, but we are updating it for uh, a new version. Uh, so I'll just focus here in terms of uh, what one should do in terms of uh, uh, extent of disease evaluation. We don't technically call it staging because it's not really related to prognosis based on the different sites of involvement of this tumor. In any event, so obviously the gold standard for brain is a, is a contrast-enhanced MRI. Every, every patient should have a lumbar puncture if it is safe to perform a lumbar puncture. For cytology and flow, every patient should see an ophthalmologist and, and have at least a slit lamp evaluation, good retinal examination. And I'll tell you why in just a moment. And then, of course, to prove that this is a primary CNS lymphoma, you have to exclude lymphoma elsewhere. So right now, it really is CT PET of the body. It's controversial, but most people do get a bone marrow aspirate biopsy. 
And if the PET is negative, you probably really don't need to do a testicular ultrasound of, uh, in older men. So this is a characteristic CT appearance of a, of a primary CNS uh, lymphoma. Um, and again, when I say that, it's synonymous with primary CNS diffused large B cell lymphoma. That's just too much to say. So uh, here's a, a CT before contrast and after contrast. It's a patient of mine who ended up as a New England Journal CPC. Uh, you can see that there's something going on here, even without contrast. There's hyperdensity here in the region of the corpus callosum. Then you give a little contrast, and it just lights up. So the splenium of the corpus callosum, a classic location uh, of this tumor. Homogeneous enhancement, another characteristic feature. There's not necrosis or cystic change within this. Here's the MRI done literally an hour or two later in the emergency ward. And you can see that there's the higher fidelity of MRI. With, uh, in, you can actually see that this patient has disease out here in the cortex as well as disease in the uh, corpus callosum. So again, gold standard is MRI with contrast. PET. FDG PET hasn't found uh, a, a, a uh, key role yet in the management of these patients. It's certainly a, uh, a positive in most patients. If you actually uh, obtain PET, there's a little bit of data, a small case series that FDG PET response might be predictive of uh, outcome in primary CNS lymphoma, but very small numbers. Um, so PET really hasn't found, brain PET really hasn't found a, a critical role yet in the management of these patients. Now, body, I mentioned earlier body CT PET. This was an interesting study, over 150 so-called primary CNS lymphomas who had body CT PET. And in the PET, uh, in these, again, quote, unquote, primary cases, 15% had other lesions. 11% were other sites of lymphoma. 4% were uh, a second, actually, second neoplasm. So pointing out, pointing out the importance of uh, adding PET to the systemic evaluation of these patients. If you look at the sites <coughs> of involvement, so first of all, in the immunocompetent host, uh, about a third have multiple lesions. Conversely, two-thirds will have a single lesion. If you look at where these lesions are in the brain, they bear basically parallel blood flow. So most of these end up in the frontal regions of the brain. So-called classic location, deep lesions, like the one I showed you in the corpus callosum, that's only about 40% of cases. Now, this was a series of over 400 cases where they looked at distribution of these tumors, and they also looked at the eye and the CSF. And in this series, 13% of patients who had brain lymphoma had concurrent involvement of the eye, either the uvea, the retina, et cetera. Also in this study, 16% had concurrent involvement of spinal fluid. So again, highlighting the importance of performing a lumbar puncture, if you can do that safely, and having the ophthalmologist look in to see if there's involvement of the eye. It may not initially change your treatment, but it certainly will change how you follow the patient. And I'll spend the rest of the time really talking about uh, treatment and, and hopefully some new developments. So first, prognostic markers. There are two systems that we use. One was developed by the IELSG, and that takes into account five factors, and the negative factors are older age, compromised performance status, elevated serum LDH, elevated CSF protein, or a deep location in the brain. And they had complete information on over 100 of these cases on these, in these factors. And you can see that you can nicely stratify three groups. Good prognosis, zero to one of these negative factors. Intermediate prognosis, two to three. Poor prognosis, median survival uh, of less than a year if you have four or five of these factors. This is a little clunky in that it does require you to have the CSF protein to implement this model. So there's interest in more simplified versions, and this is the version that most of us use in, our, in developing clinical trials and randomized clinical trials. Is this uh, uh, that was developed out by Lauren Avery when she was at Memorial Sloan Kettering that simply uh, stratifies patients by age and performance status. And you can see that you can nicely develop or, or stratify patients into three uh, different groups, and you can get age and performance status on every single patient. So this is the one that we've tended to use in our, as I said, in our clinical trial designs. And finally, before I talk about drugs <coughs> and treatments, uh, the IPCG also developed consensus guidelines for assessment of these patients over time. You have to keep in mind this is a multi-compartmental disease, eye, brain, CSF, so you have to have a multi-compartmental assessment of these patients. I won't bore you with the details, but again, this was in the paper uh, 10 years ago in JCO. 
but basically it takes, it takes into account uh, when you call a CR, unconfirmed CR, PR, et cetera, it takes into account the brain imaging, the steroid dose, the eye examination results, and the CSF results. And that this is the, the system that has also been adopted into almost all of the uh, prospective clinical trials that have been done subsequent to 2005. Now this is an oncology audience and for the non oncologists so I apologize to the oncologists, for the non-oncologists in the audience, uh, we really think about treatment in two phases. We think about a remission induction period of therapy when we're trying to achieve a complete remission or response. And then we think of a remission consolidation phase of treatment where we're trying to consolidate that complete response and achieve durable remission and actually achieve cure uh, in, this, uh, in this lymphoma. Okay. Uh, a word about corticosteroids. Uh, you all know these are lymphotoxic drugs, so uh, they're built into many of the, the, the classic regimen, P and CHOP, of course, prednisone. And it's been shown that, that steroids alone can induce radiographic responses uh, in CNS lymphoma. Complete responses, I would say, are rare, but partial responses are not uncommon. And in fact, in one study, it was shown that if you had a response to steroids, you had a great outcome. You had a, a long survival. Problem is, if, you, if steroids are used prior to a biopsy, it makes life difficult for our colleagues like Dan Bratt. Sometimes it can be almost impossible, or impossible, to make a diagnosis because it can so disrupt the cell morphology and architecture. So we really should be avoiding these uh, 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 steroids. If you have a classic MRI or CT scan like I showed you earlier, you should really not be using steroids. And it is the rare patient who needs immediate treatment with an anti edema drug. If they do need that, give them a slug of mannitol and, 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 give, and get them biopsied very early. Okay, <clears throat> in terms of how therapy has evolved for primary CNS lymphoma. I'm just going to put everything on the board. Sorry about the, this. Finally. Okay, so in the 70s and the 80s, the standard of care for this disease was whole brain radiation therapy. And why whole brain? I showed you MRIs where you can see a tumor. Why are you giving whole brain? Because it's very clear that this is a tumor, as I pointed out, can be in the eye, can be in the CSF, and can be throughout the brain as well. So there's a component of it you can see, macroscopic disease you can see on the MRI. There's a microscopic component that you cannot. So really, whole, if you're going to use radiation, it's whole brain, is the, and that was the standard. Uh, 36 to 40 gray was the dose. The next step was to add in chemotherapy, the so-called so combined modality therapy. And this actually did tr double and triple survival compared to whole brain radiation alone. Problem it was we recognized that in, especially in patients over the age of 60, the whole brain comes with a price. That is to say there's a, a fair degree of neurotoxicity. So there were really two approaches at that point. One was um, uh, to de-escalate the dose of the whole brain and try to use a less toxic dose of whole brain but keep it in the regimen or to eliminate, defer whole brain in the newly diagnosed setting and just use chemotherapy. And I would say in the last five years, kind of the next step in this arm has been to look at intensifying chemotherapy uh, in patients who are, who are eligible to receive high-dose chemotherapy and, uh, and an autologous stem cell transplant. So I'll talk about some of these. Now, I'm going to focus today, and I, as I stand here today, I can focus really on randomized trials. Even 10 years ago, I could not. Uh, because there were, there were very few, handful of randomized trials. Now, these are randomized phase two trials for the most part, but it's, it's a better data set that we have now than we did uh, 10 years ago. So this was the very first randomized trial, primary CNS lymphoma, done in the UK uh, by MRC, and it asked a simple question. Uh, we, we're going to use whole brain radiation alone, which was the standard of care, or we're going to add CHOP to whole brain radiation standard regimen for non-Hodgkin lymphoma at the time. Uh, so this trial was open for seven years, a accrued rare tumor, accrued very slowly. So they ended up closing it early. Only 53 patients uh, were enrolled, just over half the target enrollment. And read into it what you will, there really was no difference in the progression-free survival or overall survival in, in the two arms, whether you added CHOP you had CHOP and radiation, or you just had radiation alone. So a word about CHOP is CHOP is um, these drugs in CHOP, uh, you all know them well, are for the most part large molecular weight uh, uh, hydrophilic molecules. 
So one can predict that they are not going to be great brain penetrating drugs. So it's not surprising really that CHOP uh, is not very effective for primary CNS lymphoma. What you often see with CHOP is what you see with steroids, an initial response, but it's a very short duration and then the tumor begins to progress again. So that was the first randomized trial. The second one that was successfully, at first successfully executed randomized trial was published now seven, seven or eight years ago, and it was done by the IELSG uh, in uh, Andreas Ferreri. And this, this trial also asked a very simple question, uh, induction chemotherapy question. We're going to use high-dose methotrexate alone, uh, which is arguably probably the most effective uh, drug for, for this tumor, or we're going to use a combination of, of high-dose methotrexate and cytarabine, another anti-metabolite gets into the brain. Uh, so that was the question. And then all the patients after that received whole brain radiation, again, considered the standard of care at the time. So you have to squint, but here's the methotrexate alone, here's the combination methotrexate ARC, and you can see that the CR proportion much higher, complete remission proportion much higher when you add ARC to methotrexate, and then you follow these patients out, and the patients who had the combination had improved failure-free survival and improved overall survival. So Ferrari et al. Uh, and colleagues uh, consider this now the, the standard, the methotrexate and ARC together followed by whole brain. So they went on to conduct this randomized trial, and half of this has been published. And I'm, again, I'm sorry about the graphics. I'm just going to get them all up. Uh, the first half of this is published. So this, this trial, this is a randomized trial that asks two questions, an induction question and a consolidation question. The induction question is, again, refining the chemotherapy. So the control now is our methotrexate and ARC together, but let's build on that. So they added in rituximab to one arm, and they added in rituximab, thiotipa, excellent CNS penetrating alkylating drug in the other arm. So this was the so-called matrix, the acronym, four drugs, three drugs, two drugs. And then all of the patients who had stable disease or better had a second randomization for a consolidation question. And that question was whole brain radiation at a standard dose versus high dose chemotherapy and, and a stem cell transplant. So we have now the results of the first randomization. And we've, we've seen the preliminary results of the second randomization at ASH just a few months ago. But the first randomization is asking that chemotherapy question. And here are the results. So arm C is the matrix arm, the four drug arm. And you can see that it, it's superior to the other two arms, complete response about 50% of cases versus 23% and 30%. Uh, so in terms of response, radiographic response, four drugs is better than three and two. Uh, the other thing that was of interest was whether this was gonna somehow compromise the ability to collect stem cells and in, impact their ability to, for that second randomization, and it did not. So patients who had matrix chemotherapy were able to get enough stem cells harvested to take them on to transplant. Here are the uh, PFS and OS curves. The green curve, better progression-free overall survival, is the matrix arm. So matrix chemotherapy over the other two arms. This is complicated to interpret, however, because remember there's a second randomization. And so each of these curves is going to have a mixture of whole brain and transplant patients in it. So we really have to wait to see the results of that second uh, randomization to, to know how this fares. Now, I've already mentioned the fact that um, with the whole brain, sometimes, especially at 36 or 40 gray, you pay a price for that. This is a patient who was referred to me as, a, as a, a, a case of a possible relapse of their primary CNS lymphoma. So here's the patient's MRI, and here's where their lymphoma was. It was in the caudate nucleus, and now it's just a cavity. And so the patient's in remission but you can see that all of this abnormal signal in the white matter here. And if you begin to look closer, you notice there's a lot, fair amount of cortical atrophy in this case, and even some, central, some dilation of the ventricles. So this is, this is what you can see sometimes uh, in el mainly elderly patients, over 60, uh, who have received kind of these standard doses of whole brain. So this is a patient who's struggling with gait, cognition, et cetera, in remission from their lymphoma, has paid a price for this remission for, for, from the therapy. So we want to try to uh, mitigate this. We want to avoid this if we can. So the IPCG put together a task force of neuropsychologists a few years ago and looked at this. And the, clearly, the main risk factor is age. And 60 seems to be somewhat of a magical cut point. 
So age over 60, you're at high risk for this. And any regimen that includes a standard dose, 36 to, 6, 36 to 40 gray, of whole brain seems to be the highest risk uh, treatment. And the worst possible out, um, uh, sequence is a whole brain radiation first followed by high dose methotrexate chemotherapy. So that's, a, that's one we want to avoid, that sequence. They also identified the domains that seem to be most sensitive to this change. And that's important because we developed a battery that focuses on these four domains and can be administered over about 30 minutes by a research technician. You don't really need a neuropsychologist to do this. So this battery has actually been incorporated now into multiple prospective uh, randomized trials. Uh, and we argue strongly that a secondary endpoint in these trials should be neurocognitive outcomes. We can't just look at PFS and OS in this population. So it begs the question. Can we lower the dose of whole brain? So this was work from the Sloan Kettering group <clears throat> where they asked that question. So again, combined modality, it's chemotherapy and whole brain, but a lower dose of whole brain. So this was a multi-center phase two trial, 50 patients, mean age 60. And they got the kind of the regimen that's used at Memorial, RMPV, methotrexate, vincristine, procarbazine, rituximab, followed by consolidation with a lower dose, 23 gray versus 36 to 40 of whole brain, followed by some ARC. So 60% of their patients had complete responses. Their two-year progression-free survival is, is quite good, about 80%, and median progression-free survival, also good, three years. So uh, this looks, looks good in this kind of smaller study. And they also reported neuropsychological function in these patients. And at least in short-term follow-up when this was published, it was reported as relative stable. There's a little bit of fluctuation, but we'll have to see what happens over the long term with these patients. But this was really the basis then to launch a formal randomized trial, which is this trial, which was done in NRG. It used to be known as RTOG, now NRG. And in this trial, uh, patients uh, were randomized or stratified based on that prognostic scale I told you about earlier to, to chemotherapy alone using that RMPB regimen followed by RC versus chemotherapy but adding in that lower dose of uh, whole brain. So this has completed accrual now, but we're not going to have the readout probably for another one to two years from this study. But we will have a readout. Maybe to take it a little further, can we eliminate whole brain from the initial treatment of these patients? So this was a, a randomized trial done in Germany, uh, published a few years ago in the Lancet Oncology. 75 centers, over 500 patients were randomized. It's the largest trial ever done in primary medicine is lymphoma. Uh, a lot of controversy about this trial. They changed the chemotherapy halfway through. But the basic design was a chemotherapy alone approach versus a chemotherapy plus whole brain radiation approach. And what they report, if you look at the intent to treat analysis, is that those patients who receive the whole brain, that's the red curve here, had a statistically significant improvement in their progression-free survival. But if you look at overall survival, there really was no difference in the two uh, arms of therapy. So again, this has created some controversy in the field. My simplistic reading of it is that uh, if you defer whole brain, you're probably not compromising survival because you can use it later. So maybe you can avoid that risk of neurotoxicity by deferring it and using it in the relapse refractory setting. This is our regimen uh, that we developed with James Rubenstein at UCSF. It's MTR. So we use, for induction, we use high-dose methotrexate uh, combined with temozolomide and rituximab. And I'll point out that unlike other regimens, this regimen is built off data from single agent activity of each of these drugs in primary CNS lymphoma. So that's induction. And then uh, in this particular uh, iteration of it, our consolidation was more chemotherapy with different agents, etoposide uh, and ARC. Uh, just show you a little bit of background on each of these agents alone, because these were all our studies. So this was a study we did in the, in the old, now called the ABTC. It used to be called the NAVIC Consortium which Emory's a member of. So we use methotrexate monotherapy here. Uh, eight, no other drugs, no radiation. 50% of the patients had complete responses. But the median progression free survival was not that great, about 13 months. But if you look out, you know, these patients could be salvaged. If you look at median overall survival, about five years. And 20% of these patients never relapsed. And this, now we have follow-up uh, of over 10 years, and those five never relapsed. 
So a small proportion of these patients appear to be cured just with methotrexate alone. But the glass is clearly uh, not even half full. We have to do much, much better than that. Here's rituximab. You all know this. Uh, because it is a charged protein molecule, one, again, would predict it would not get into the brain or CSF that well, and that is true. It does not. It has very low concentrations. When you give it systemically, you get about 0.1% of the level, the blood level, into the CSF. And there's been some labeling studies that shows it poorly penetrates a tumor. Nevertheless, there have been anecdotal reports of complete responses in primary CNS conformal to this drug. So we ran a small uh, pilot trial, again, through NCI Navit. 12 patients just received rituximab, that's all. And you can see that five of the 12 had responses and, and four of those responses were complete responses. Uh, again, these were not durable, but clearly the drug has some activity and the way that I've always viewed this is, um, you know, when the way we use this drug is we build it in up front in the induction setting when there's diffuse disruption of blood-brain barrier and you can drive the drug into the brain and try to get a higher proportion of CRs, and then we drop rituximab uh, after that. And I think that's probably the right way uh, to use the drug. Uh, so back to our, our, our regimen that uh, we developed with, with our colleagues at UCSF. Uh, this is, a, we ran a, a multi-center cooperative group study in Alliance, uh, 46 patients, and with this MTR regimen followed by etoposide ARC, Median overall, a median progression free survival of two and a half years, and we had not reached our median overall survival by the time we uh, uh, published this. Um, we didn't do neuropsychological testing, but no overt neurotoxicity was really, really observed. So um, uh, that's, uh, an, uh, that's the regimen now that we're using, except that I'll come back at the end and talk about how we've, we've adapted it to incorporate high dose chemotherapy and uh, stem cell transplants. So let me say a few words about that now. Um, so this is, uh, most of this initial work was done in Europe. Uh, initially in France, in the relapse setting, one study, and then in the newly diagnosed setting done mainly in Germany uh, and Switzerland and Italy. So this was uh, Gerald Illerhaus, who's now in Stuttgart, and they had a multi-center prospective phase two trial, 80 patients, primary CNS lymphoma, and note, of course, that the median age of their patients in this transplant trial is younger. And that's to be expected, right? Because you have to have certain organ function in order to qualify for a transplant. So it's a younger population, so there's clearly some selection bias here. Their induction chemotherapy is matrix. There are four drugs I told you about early, earlier. And then their consolidation is to go on to conditioning chemotherapy with BCNU and Thiotipa. Again, great CNS penetrating drugs, high doses. And this, these are the results, so 80% CRs, complete responses after uh, transplant, their median progression-free survival over six years, and their five-year survival of, of uh, 80%. These have been updated now, and their 10-year survival is quite good as well. So these, these are impressive results, uh, but again, these are younger patients. There's clearly some selection bias that goes on. Nevertheless, I think this is probably the best outcome data you'll see with, with this uh, uh, CNS type of lymphoma. Therefore, there have been a number of randomized trials now launched of high-dose chemotherapy transplant. And the preliminary results of two were presented at ASH 2016, the ILSG, second half of that ILSG protocol and a French study. Uh, it's too early to really know. They're looking at early data points for progression-free survival. Uh, and both of these trials are, are randomizing transplant versus whole brain. And what I'll tell you what they showed was the French group showed that it looks like the transplant has better progression-free survival than whole brain. The ILSG group showed no real big difference in progression-free survival between the two arms, but early days. This is our randomized trial, which you participated in here and put some patients on. Uh, we just reached accrual. So this is uh, an intergroup study done in Alliance. Uh, this is our median progression, our median endpoint, like Almost all these trials is progression-free survival. We want an earlier readout if we can get it. Um, secondary endpoints, uh, overall survival toxicities. We have a lot of correlative uh, scientific sub-studies built into this trial. This is the design. So everyone is randomized up front, so you know which arm you're going into, but everybody gets the same induction. So everyone gets MTR 
methotrexate timazole myrituximab, followed by a, a dose of Citeris, one cycle of citerabine, and then half the patients got uh, their uh, transplanted using uh, BCNU and Thyotipa, like the German group, and then the other half went on to get consolidation with ARC and etoposide, which has been our standard regimen. So there's no radiation uh, built into this trial. So we reached accrual as of just uh, in May, uh, but we're not going to have a readout for three years, so we won't really have any thing to present on this for a few years, but uh, again, we, we will have some, we will have a readout at some point. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, transplant um, is going to be germane for a relatively younger age primary CNS lymphoma population. If you'll remember, the median age of diagnosis of this tumor is 65. So what do we do for more than half of our patients who are probably not going to be eligible for a transplant? This is a big problem. And we don't have a lot of trials at all in the elderly population. This is one uh, that was done by Antonio Muro, who's now in Miami. But this was done when he was in France. So these were patients over the age of 60. Uh, and they were randomized. Uh, the, the idea here is that we're going to avoid radiation. And we're going to try two chemotherapy regimens. We're going to try our kind of our... Our, reg, our standard regimen at the time, for them it was again the MPV, R, well it was MPV, R was not in, in this yet regimen, or let's try to dose de-escalate in this elderly population. Let's have, you know, hopefully we'll have less toxicity. So the other arm was a, more, was a simplified arm of just methotrexate and timazolamide. So that's this arm, and this is kind of the standard chemotherapy arm that all of their patients were getting. So these are the results um, published a couple of years ago now, uh, 98 patients. Bottom line is even though the trends for progression-free survival, overall survival response, favored the more aggressive chemotherapy, none of those reached statistical significance. So the trends were in that direction, but none of them were statistically significant. So you kind of have to read it the way you will, uh, but I think there's, you know, a lot of interest in trying to look at less toxic regimens in, in this population. Uh, this is another recent publication. It was really not a randomized trial. It was just a large multicenter phase two where they used a pretty aggressive chemotherapy regimen in elderly patients, rituximab, methotrexate, procarbazine, and CCNU. They had to drop the CCNU partway through the trial because of toxicity, and their outcomes are not that good. 35% CRs. 37% to your progression-free survival, to your overall survival, less than half. So, you know, uh, uh, there's certainly a lot of room for improvement in the elderly population. But I would say it's, a, to me, as someone who's been around in this field for a little while, it's an exciting time because we are finally getting results. We're getting randomized trials uh, developed. We're getting them successfully completed, and we're finally beginning to see some results. And this is a kind of a listing, I have to update this, but these are the completed randomized trials asking induction questions. We talked about all of these except this one. This is a Dutch, Australian, New Zealand trial where they're asking rituximab question. So the same chemotherapy in both arms, but one arm has rituximab, one arm does not, has not read out yet. And then there are a number of trials that we've talked about these for consolidation questions. We've had a readout on one. These two are pending. Uh, these, actually, these four are pending. Uh, and then there's the an on ongoing, another trial in Europe uh, where they've dropped now, in their upfront setting, they've dropped radiation. So now their trials are chemotherapy versus chemotherapy. Every one of the, well, almost all of these patients, especially elderly patients, will experience some relapse, and what do we have to offer for salvage therapies? The challenge is that the, the clinical uh, uh, trial landscape here is, is really barren. And one of the problems is we've never really developed consensus definitions on what's relapse, what's refractory disease, what kind of evaluation should we have for these patients, what should our eligibility for clinical trials be, and what should our response criteria be. So just like we did the IPCG, IPCG did in the newly diagnosed setting, we're trying to do this now in the relapse refractory setting. So we're developing these guidelines and we'll publish them. Uh, because we really need to do uh, trials in the relapse refractory setting, and there are some. So this was the very first uh, transplant trial in primary CNS lymphoma, and it was done uh, in the relapse refractory setting in France, 43 patients, and uh, you can see that those patients who 
completed the transplant, had a really impressive overall survival. And th this is relapse disease, five-year overall survival uh, if you got through the transplant. Again, there's some selection bias here, clearly. But this was the signal <coughs> that, this, that this is an active regimen. And this was really the impetus to move this up into the newly diagnosed setting. So really, all of the transplant trials now are being done in the newly diagnosed setting. But the very first one was done at relapse refractory, in a relapse refractory setting. And if a patient has not had a transplant and they might be eligible, this is certainly something that could be an option for them at the time of relapse. A subset of patients who have an, a robust and durable response to methotrexate chemotherapy in the old days, we would just treat them with methotrexate again when they had a relapse. Some people still do this, and it's very effective. I mean, you can, this is a, a multi-center, but this was really retrospective. This was kind of our practice uh, at the time. But, but we had, uh, these were patients who had had a complete response to methotrexate, treated a second time, and you can see that 20 out of 22 treated a second time had 91% had a second CR. So it maintains activity in the median survival of these patients treated for a second and some a third time is quite good, it's five years. But again, highly selected group of patients. So these are patients who had a CR to initial methotrexate, uh, largely monotherapy. And one could look at this now and say, these data may be uh, calling out for us to, to intensify our chemotherapy rather than really just treating with methotrexate again. And that's what we're doing. What about whole brain? You can use it in the relapse refractory setting. This was work from our place again, where we used it just in that setting. And you can see that uh, patients who uh, uh, were treated at the time of relapse, about 40% had a, a CR, uh, so 75% had some response, and the median overall survival after, re after radiation was about a year, 11 months. And in fact, that's about what you get with whole brain alone in the newly diagnosed setting. So it does maintain activity in the relapse refractory setting. So let me say a few words about novel therapeutics. We are lagging sorely behind uh, the, um, the uh, study of novel therapeutics and other hematologic malignancies. But there is some light, I hope, at the end of the tunnel. So a uh, few agents that have been recently published, in, uh, uh, as you see there, one is lenalidomide, uh, which is uh, a so-called immunomodulatory agent, but it turns out that it does have very clear anti-proliferative properties as a drug. And some of that is related to this expression of a molecule known as cerebron, uh, which, is, which was, is expressed on diffuse large B-cell lymphoma cells in the CNS. A nice paper by James Rubenstein showing this. And this is an active drug. Now, this, what I'm showing you here is a very small snapshot. It's only six patients, but it's what's published. And three of these relapse refractory patients had responses to lenalidomide alone. And two of them had complete responses. And at ASH, uh, just a few months ago, uh, there are a couple of studies presented, much larger data set, but not yet published. Patients in, their, in the, the N of 40 to 50 range where clearly the drug has activity as a monotherapy. And, and there should be, uh, there is now an effort to begin to combine this with other uh, treatments, other drugs. Tim Serolimus, mTORC inhibitor. Uh, there's evidence that there's aberrant activation of mTORC PI3 kinase signaling in these primary CNS lymphomas. Uh, this was uh, pac uh, 37 patients, a phase two trial. Uh, overall response rate was not bad, but complete responses were low and the median of progression-free survival was, was quite low, was poor. So this drug, at, at a minimum, will need a partner uh, if, we, if we continue to look at mTORC inhibitors in primary CNS lymphoma. So here's the exciting stuff. So these were papers that were just published this summer, one in cancer discovery, one in cancer cell. This is the group from Memorial, and the next paper is the group from uh, NCI. So I mentioned earlier that, um, that uh, this B-cell receptor-mediated signaling through Bruton's tyrosine kinase appears to be uh, highly activated in primary CNS lymphomas, even more so than diffuse large B-cell lymphoma elsewhere in the body. So there's been interest in looking at a BTK, Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and there have been uh, reports of anecdotal activity. So this, again, is a small study, uh, 
13 patients. These are heavily pre-treated. Some of these patients had had transplant and had failed transplant. Given ibrutinib monotherapy, uh, 10 out of the 13 responded, five complete, respon re complete responses. There was one patient who was refractory, no response, tumor grew. And it turns out that patient had a CARD11 mutation, which is in this pathway, but it's distal to where this drug acts. So you would predict that a patients, patients who have CARD11 mutations would not be responsive to this BTK inhibitor. And indeed, there was one patient that was seen in it. The, the incomplete responders also seem to have concurrent mutations in CD79. And that is felt to activate mTOR PI3 kinase uh, pathway. And it was shown, actually, you, I refer you to the paper, but it was shown in cell line work that when you knock out both of those pathways, you knock out BTK and use an mTOR inhibitor, in these that have a CD79 mutation, those cells die. So now there will be a trial, hopefully, of a brutinib plus uh, an mTORC inhibitor. Now the interesting thing about this is that in this study, in these first 13 pati uh, patients, there was a case of invasive uh, CNS aspergillosis, and the patient actually died. And <clears throat> let me tell you about this other trial first. So this is the NCI trial. Uh, this is in cancer cell. These came out almost at the same time this summer. Now this was, uh, the design here was different. So they used ibrutinib <clears throat> as monotherapy in, an, in a window. And then after that window of treatment, they then used combination chemotherapy that was really built uh, to target ABC subtype of diffuse large cell lymphoma. So that's the dose-adapted Teddy R regimen, and I can, it's, Temozolomide, etoposide, doxorubicin, dexamethasone, ibrutinib, rituximab. So 18 patients. And what they saw, though, in that window of ibrutinib alone, that most of the patients, almost all, had some response to ibrutinib alone. So, uh, and these, these were, again, correlated in these patients who had M MYD88 and CD79 uh, mutations. 86% <clears throat> of their patients entered a CR after you treated with a combined regimen. <clears throat> and again, these incomplete responses were those that had these uh, CD79 mutations. And again, they observed, actually in this case, they observed, observed several cases of aspergillosis, pulmonary and CNS. And they went on to do, and I refer you to the paper again, they went on to do some <clears throat> work in mice <clears throat> showing that this antifungal immunity is dependent on BTK signaling. So, Unfortunately, this looks like it might be an on-target effect of the drug, of ibrutinib. <clears throat> so there needs to be a, some additional thought about how, this, uh, how we can avoid aspergillosis. And there's a French study of ibrutinib, but I'm not showing you. It was shown at ASH. And there was also an observation of a couple of cases of aspergillosis. And lastly, but not leastly, I'll show you more anecdote. So this is, uh, I mentioned that there were the, we, we saw a higher proportion of patients with gains in chromosome 9P, which lead to increased signaling and importance of the PD-PDL1 pathway. So there's been some interest in the use of checkpoint inhibitors, PD-1, PDL1 inhibitors in uh, primary CNS lymphoma. So this is the first series reported at ASH. This was from Lakshmi uh, Nayak at Nana Farber. And uh, this is just uh, uh, five patients, again, case series. Uh, but again, heavily pretreated patients. And, and this was a little messy because they got not only nivolumab, checkpoint inhibitor, but they also got some rituximab, et cetera. But uh, a couple of them did not. This was, a, this was just nivolumab here. And you can see this patient had a, a robust response to nivolumab. In fact, there are four CRs. Uh, I personally treated a physician on this trial. It's a trial now. Uh, who had a, a very large burden of disease and had a complete response to nivolumab alone. And it maintained it for about six months. So now this is a, uh, uh, the subject of a multicenter phase two trial that's underway in the relapsed or refractory uh, disease setting. The last thing I say, I don't have a slide on it, but we're also um, uh, report, have reported recently, and I'll give you a real anecdote, an N of one, which is a patient with a, uh, treated with a CAR T cell. So this was an anti-CD19 CAR. And the patient was treated in violation of the protocol. So this was a patient, this was a patient who had relapsed refractory disease. Uh, 
and they, it was discovered at the last minute there was a large brain mass, and the patient was treated anyway. Uh, and uh, a month later, the brain mass was gone with this anti-CD19. So now we are trying to uh, motivate uh, the company to let us look at this in a, in a small series of patients. All right, summary. summary. So we're dealing with a very uncommon subtype of non-Hodgkin lymphoma. We're essentially dealing with aggressive large cell histology. Almost all of these are ABC immunophenotype. I didn't really show you any data, but there does not appear to be any real role for surgical resection of this tumor. Uh, you really should ask your neurosurgeon to do a biopsy only. Whole brain alone is palliative, and in older patients associated with clinical neurotoxicity. Methotrexate-based chemotherapy is our standard induction. You can choose your alphabet soup, which one you use. We use MTR. Optimal consolidation therapy really has not been defined. The options that are out there under study are high-dose chemotherapy transplant in those who are eligible, maybe reduced dose whole brain radiation, or some other type of chemotherapy. And I'm, I told you a little bit about novel, novel therapeutics. So our IPCG meeting meets every year at ASH. This will be our 15th or 16th, 15th year coming up. I've had the pleasure of co-chairing this for years with Franco Cavalli. And uh, our, we have a scientific topic each morning of our meeting, and then in the afternoon we have our regular session. So this year, uh, if, if anyone's interested, we're, we're looking at novel imaging assessments and endpoints in primary CMS lymphoma. So we're going to focus a lot on PET, actually. So we're uh, Heiko Schroeder from Sloan Kettering is a PET expert to see if we can figure out a role for PET uh, in this disease. Um, in, our, in our randomized trial, we had a sub-study of FDG PET uh, again, trying to determine if it is a predictor of response. So that'll be the day. It's actually the day before ASH. We always do it the day before ASH. So let me acknowledge uh, uh, a few people. Uh, so f certainly the international group, the IPCG, and Franco and Jim, who actually got it off the ground, and our, our current uh, commi executive committee members, and, and my funding and, and philanthropy, which supports this. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>